poor and struggling, and we just lift that country to you and really just pray for rain. And for those that are known to us, we just pray that they would know your presence with them and the encouragement that comes from you. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to share a Bible reading with us now. I'm going to read it a couple of times. And there is, um, yeah, the key verse, one of the key verses up there, just as we reflect. So I'm going to read it a couple of times to give you a chance really to think about it and think on it. It's Mark 8, verses 34 to 9, verses 1. So it's not a long passage. Just spend some time reflecting and meditating on God's word as it's read to you. Out of the way of the cross. Then he, Jesus, called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. There's a lot to take in, so I'm going to read it one more time and then pray for Rob and we're here. Rob unpack it for us. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Father, we bring this um, topic, these words inspired by you before you and ask that you will open our hearts. Ask that you will give us the strength and the courage to be open to you and to what you'd like to plant within us and what you'd like to mould within us as individuals but also as a congregation together. We pray that you'll be with Rob. Give him uh, strength and power and clarity in his words. And Lord, um, bless him for the message he brings to us this morning. Help us not just to hear it, but to do it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was a companion of 
Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas was very attached to Mark, uh, taking him around places. It caused a massive dispute between uh, Barnabas and Paul. Uh, so bad that actually they parted company and Barnabas went off with John Mark elsewhere. Um, and then John Mark disappeared for a while, and then later on we find him back again. Uh, and uh, it's believed that uh, John Mark attached himself to Peter. And, and if he wanted the gospel to close to what Peter wanted to say, then, John, then Mark's gospel is pretty much Peter's gospel uh, brought uh, to the chorus. It's a very Romanized gospel, it's not like some of the others, uh, particularly Matthew and John, which are very uh, Jewish gospels. This is a much more Romanized gospel. And so what uh, Mark brings is quite a lot of action. If you see it, if you, if you try reading the uh, Christmas story from Mark's gospel, Find it. Uh, uh, he's uh, very much in there, so like action man Jesus. Jesus did this, everyone's amazed, and then off they go. go. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a useful um, uh, ability just to, to get that background as we uh, get involved in this year. Um, and uh, I love much of Jesus' teaching and ministry, as I'm sure you do. Uh, and you know, this kind of the, the teaching of love. Um, it's teaching on love and healing uh, people and bringing uh, brokenness into healing. Uh, and you find that a lot in Mark's Gospel. Uh, he very much focuses on that. And then we like that kind of stuff. And then we come to this teaching. This teaching is the kind of stuff we don't like as much. We don't like as much. It's not quite so easy to listen to, is it? Uh, but we need to listen to it. Where are we when we get to this point? Well, we've got to the mid point in the gospel. John, in Mark chapter 8, the six of these chapters, we're at the midpoint of the, of the gospel. Peter has just made this a declaration. But what about you, Jesus? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. That's Mark chapter 8 as well, just before we started this passage. Uh, he says this stuff. And, uh, and, and something about Jesus, the ministry, the teaching, the life of Jesus, has, has caused Peter to look at Jesus and think, I don't think I know who this guy is. I don't think I know who this guy is. And, it's, and what, what transpires is something that inspires him to faith. What about you, Jesus asks? Who do you say I am? Peter asks, if you are the Messiah. And Jesus then goes on to outline a turning point in his ministry. He's turning from the ministry in Galilee and he's beginning to turn towards Jerusalem and the beginning to head south. And then Jesus goes on to outline what it means to take Peter's declaration to another level. He's just a declaration of faith in God, faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and take it into something called discipleship. Discipleship. And that's uh, one of the, uh, you know, to follow Jesus is one thing, to be a disciple of Jesus is something else. It's one thing to be excited about what Jesus does, to be thrilled in the miracles he performed. To, to be inspired by his teaching, to, to be enthralled by his love for people, and, and to desire to follow him, him and, and to become his disciple. But the big question is, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? Well, a disciple on one level is a student. A student stands up. Um, if you wanted to be a, a, a student of something, uh, um, and do the academic Work. So, so in the uh, time of Jesus, you would have many rabbis uh, going around to the countryside. There would be various schools of rabbi, 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 and there would be various schools, and they would be focused on different things. And you have these rabbis who were who sat under the teaching of a, a very well-known rabbi previously, and, and they would go around and they would choose students, and they would uh, go around. It's done kind of intimated last week. Uh, the rabbis would take on the very best academic skilled people from the synagogue in any uh, given year. And, and they would then join the rabbi's school. The rabbi would say to the very best of them, you come and follow me. You come and follow me. And they would join the rabbi and they would go to the rabbinic school and they would learn. I suppose rabbinic studies in those days is a bit like if you were a good footballer or you were a footballer down at Burton, okay? Hoping that at some point a scout and ball would come. 
Also, us will come, and they will come, and they will, uh, and they will, they will come into the into the club, and they will see little Freddie playing with his fabulous football game, sticking the ball, curling it around into the top corner of the net, and they go, "That's the lad we need in our uh, taking an apprenticeship in our club." Clubs are scouting for young players with serious potential to give them an apprenticeship in the, in the club. And the Olympic School was a bit like that. They scout for the best students and they take them to the next level to learn the traditions from the master rabbis. And, and, then, uh, and, and that would be a particular tradition of that rabbi. They did it in the, in the rabbinic school and they would follow the rabbi. Now, now one level we'd say, well, that's what Jesus was doing. But there are some differences, but we looked at that a little bit last time. As we saw last week, Jesus didn't choose the very best academic minds. Hallelujah. I hear you all cry. I join you in that sleep. He didn't choose the very best minds from the synagogue. He chose in some ways the very worst students, you can imagine, to come with him. The students came from the tax booth. The students came from the fishing boats. The students came from random boats sitting under trees. It was random stuff, it seemed. And someone looked at the selection of Jesus' disciples a little while ago, and they decided that what they would do is they'd take the selection of disciples and they would put them through a modern uh, selection process. And they went through the selection process and they found that only one disciple of Jesus met the ground. It was Jesus Iscariot. Jesus didn't choose the very best students in the way that the rabbis went around and did it. He did it very differently. But there's also something familiar about it if you're uh, familiar with the Old Testament as well. In 1, chapter, one Samuel chapter 16, we find a very familiar story. Where Sam, Sam goes out to find a new king. Saul has been a bit of a flop, and he's gone out to find a new king. And he assumes as normal that will be the eldest son of a family that he already knew. He knew which family the king was going to come from, but he assumed it would be the, the, the eldest son. And, and this is a uh, passage. Uh, oh, there we go. There it is. Uh, and and when they, they, it says here, but uh, when, when they arrived, Samuel saw him, the, the eldest son, and thought, well, surely the Lord's anointed scattered before the Lord, you know. Uh, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance, his height, in other words, his handsomeness and his strength, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's what we're finding with Jesus. It's not like the rabbis who went around scouting the best talent because they had the best understanding of uh, rabbinic rules and the Torah. Jesus went around looking in the hearts. He went around looking in the hearts for people who were willing to follow him. You see, we can look at those people uh, that Jesus chose in the, in the worldly way, and we would not choose any one of them. Because they're not the best. And in the worldly sense, they're not the best. But they're actually not our best. But they were Jesus' best. They were Jesus' best. When you look in the mirror, you might think, well, I'm not the best. But your Jesus is best. That's why you're here today. You know, many, many times in the ministry, I have pleased people in leadership or in ministry positions, and people come, come to me and say, well, why on earth did you do that? Then you know what you're doing. I'd say, no, I don't. No, I say, <laughs> they say, they're not the person I would have chosen. You see, I'm not supposed to choose the people that we will choose. The person we must choose is not the person who sounds the best, or looks the best, or leads the best. We need God's people. His best. His best. Roger Forster, who is a Christian fellowship leader and author, uh, 
He used, he used to say this, well, he used to say something like this, I used to sit with him and he used to say something like this anyway. Where is he? There he is. He said this, the church doesn't need the people we appoint, it needs the people that God anoints. Amen? Amen. 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 We need the anointed. And, and I may look in the mirror, you may look in the mirror, and wonder why, 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 why does God want to use me or want to use you? Well, it isn't about what you see or how you feel or how you value yourself or what your self esteem is like or how you are perceived by others. It's about what God wants. And He wants you. He wants you. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's looking for the people that he needs, that he wants, the people who are going to build his church, his way, who were anointed to change the world, which they did do, to shape history, which they did do. But things do need to go on in our hearts at the same time. Second thing I noticed. In this, it is not the old story. I notice here that Jesus starts with blank paper, blank pages. These disciples are not full of the old stuff. They're not full of the old teaching and the old ways of the rabbinic schools. These people weren't good enough to go to the rabbinic schools, so they haven't been filled up with the rabbinic stuff. They are basic Torah trained with bits and pieces of teaching, but they haven't been polluted by the teachings of the rabbis. Now, uh, we don't study Jewish tradition for the same reason. We don't do Talmud studies and, and um, Mishnah studies here because we don't want to focus on what post-Jesus Jewish teaching is. We want to focus on Jesus. And Jesus needed disciples who would focus on his teaching, not all the stuff that went before. Although we did see it leak from time to time, from one to the other. Jesus had people who had limited knowledge, which was great for Jesus, because that's where he wanted to start. And if you have limited knowledge about Christianity, about faith, about doctrine, about hermeneutics, about eschatology, great, because Jesus can deal with that. If you come with all that stuff, he's thinking, oh my word, man, I've got like a whole lot of stuff here. His, His teaching was like the old school rabbis in Mark chapter 1. If you turn to there, you can find a phrase that occurs a few times in the New Testament uh, when talking about Jesus. And it's this one, Mark chapter 1, verse 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. What were they saying? They said, well, the teachers of the law, they sound all the old stuff all the time. All that old stuff comes out. There now it's about the old teachings of some rabbi in history. Jesus has got something new. It's powerful. It's new. It's life changing. And the disciples were at blank page. They just absorbed Jesus' stuff. When I became a Christian back in February of 29th, 1980, which is my birthday. My birthday. When I became a Christian, I had none of the Christian stuff in my life because I came from totally atheist family. No Bible, no Christianity, no Jesus, no Jesus talking about Christianity. Christianity. Yeah. 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 None of it, nothing. No, no church, church. I went to church, 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 I picked up a lot of stuff, probably good stuff and bad stuff over the years, but I'm blessed to say that I have learned from Jesus. I have some great teachers, Bible teachers as well, from Jesus. So it's not the old story anymore. The other thing is, it's not just about being a student. Um, being a student and being a disciple are not the same things, they're not synonymous words. Jesus didn't just teach them philosophy of theological life. 
It amazes me how many people think that Christianity is about teaching, about laws, about traditions, and about practices. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know, I'm not familiar with any of that stuff. Being a disciple is more than being a student. Disciples are apprentices, not just students. They learn not just to follow the teachings of Jesus, they learn to follow Jesus himself. And that's where we come to our passage this morning. It falls into the category of apprenticeship. Because apprenticeship involves a historically apprenticeship model. I was a student of apprentice in Melbourne. That was my apprenticeship. I left school, went off, did, uh, uh, did, did that at college, learned that, was in a workshop, learned that. Uh, for four years. I learned, I learned under a master apprentice, a master, master, master craftsman, uh, and I uh, learned my skill from him. I didn't learn a lot of it, but I learned some of his skill, it was an absolutely brilliant attention. Um, and uh, I tried to learn as much as I could from my master. But in the old days, when you did an apprenticeship, you often leave home and go and live with the master in his house and learn from him at home. And, and you leave, leave the family and you go and live alongside the master. And so Jesus says here, you want to be my disciples, you need to come with me everywhere, do everything. Not you'll learn how to be leaders, not that you'll learn how to make a difference, not that you know the difference between Armenianism and Calvinism, not that you become a real post tribulationist mythology. Whatever. Uh, no, what he's saying is you're going to need to learn to carry a cross. You're going to need to learn to carry a cross. And you're going to need to learn to survive. It is quite extraordinary, this passage, isn't it? When you begin to think about what it's really saying. The first step on the road to discipleship is the denial. The denial here meaning to put off or put to death what had gone before and to walk in a new way of doing right. The word in this passage, the denial, the original Greek word, occurs only 13 times in the New Testament and only in two occasions. It occurs 13 times, but covers only two occasions. One of them is this one. The other one is Peter's denial of Christ, which the chapter we covered a few weeks ago. This, this one, one is where Jesus tells his disciples to deny him themselves. The other is where Peter denies Jesus himself. The denial means to completely let go, to completely disassociate from, not to recognize or accept anymore. And in this case, it's our old life. And I want to suggest to you this morning, if you're finding that the hard concept to grab hold of, is not to worry too much, because it's not a momentary thing. Denial is not so right. Today I pray that I will deny myself and follow Jesus forevermore. Uh, because tomorrow, I guarantee you will fail. You'll put yourself in where Jesus should be at some point tomorrow. Denial is a lifelong process. It is about not about a single moment of prayer. If it is about a single moment of prayer, I'm afraid you're doomed to fail. And, and if you fail, you'll be disappointed, if you're disappointed, you'll be disheartened, if you're disheartened, you'll be discouraged, and you'll be demotivated. We, we won't fail. Jesus, when he says, take up your cross and follow me, is a daily decision to try to do that. That's what the discipleship is. If my, my master craftsman had given me a job, a really complicated piece of sheet metal work to do, and, and just said, right, right, you're doing that today, off you go. And, and I failed, and then he just started ranting and raging at me because I failed. And he had to show me properly how to do it a number of times, because that's what it was like. Uh, and a number of times, I would have been demotivated. I'm sorry, demotivated, disheartened. I would have wanted to give up, give in. And I find it very helpful here that the word deny is linked to those two stories. Because in one case, you've got Peter saying, Lord, you are the Messiah, you're, you're the one, you're the one, Lord. And, I'm, and then, not that far further forward, you've got him saying, I've never heard of him, I don't know him. I find it very helpful that those two words, those two stories, and the two uses of the 
were denied, there was a link. I find that very helpful because it helps me know I can fail. I don't try to fail. I can fail and still know that God stands with me in the midst of it. Well, ask Peter to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah and Jesus encourages him to begin to deny himself. Peter's is later failure. Failure to deny himself and then to deny Jesus himself. And, and then Jesus responds to John chapter 1 of lifting him up and bringing him back and reinstating him. Means that denial has to be a process, an ongoing process in our lives that takes time and will continue. We're going to fall down, but we have a Savior who wants to lift us up, dust us off, put us back on feet and say, Come on then, let's just try again. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Denial is like, like carrying the cross. It's a path, it's a journey, it's an everyday choice. A choice to deny, a choice to carry. And the more we carry, the more, uh, more we deny, the more we find ourselves on a road that gets closer to Jesus somehow. We don't know how it does. Alan Adler, uh, the most famous in actor in the TV series Match, wrote a book, and the book was called Never Have Your Dog Stuffed and Other Things I Learned. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, <laughs> in an interview, uh, he said this, he said, <laughs> yes, uh, he said that uh, he talked about having a, a live pet dog when he was eight years old. Uh, sorry, he had a live pet dog. And, and when, when it died, Adler was so, so sad about burying it, his father decided to have the dog stuffed. And, and they kept it on the porch, and the delivery men were frightened of it. And they would come in and deliver things. And Adler recalled in a TV interview with Newsweek, sorry, an interview with Newsweek, he said this. He said, I'm giving them up. There are a lot of ways we stuff the dog, trying to avoid change, hanging on to moments of the past. And I thought, when I read that, I thought, well, that's a bit to my sermon. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, well, that really does uh, speak to me in the midst of this whole idea of denying ourselves. Sometimes we just want to carry some of the old stuff with us. We want to carry it with us under our arms, like an old stuffed dog. We want to carry it under our arms. And denying ourselves and taking up our cross, we need to, to drop something in order to take up the cross. Because we can't carry that and that at the same time. It means a repeated goodbye to something that's poisonous to our spirit. It might be nice, we might like it, but it's actually poisonous to the, to the spirit. We want to keep it with us, but it's a stuffed dog, and we shouldn't keep it with us. And the question to you today, if you want to discuss that around the dinner table, is do you have any stuffed dogs in your life? <laughs> do I have any life? Are we getting in the way? They may be a comfort, but are they getting in the way of walking out of life with Jesus? In our garden at home, we bought a house where two sides of our garden uh, were surrounded by the Andyar trees. You know what the Andyar trees are? They are fast growing hedges. That if you don't keep your hand on them, they get out of hand very, very quickly. Dense plants that block the view of the neighbours, which is what you want them to do, perhaps. But they, they do, do something, something else as well. well. They, they can quickly, quickly grow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a self-detached house. They, they can quickly put a house on them. They can quickly grow it. They absorb the nutrients of the soil. They take all the water. They, they take all the light. And before you know it, you not only really can't see the neighbors, you can't see the sky. <laughs> and then if I walk plants in the garden are dying, because the soil has become acidic, and, and it's got, got very dark. dark. There's two, two things we've done for the last life. It's uh, it nice soil and, and light. Jesus calls on us to, to deny ourselves. Because by nature, we, we make ourselves acidic and dark. And, and it takes some concentration to let go of those things and to walk away from that. And and Jesus says that, that to keep hold of the stuff, to step stuff dogs and the high hedges, we lose it all, but if we go on, to let it go, it leads to healing to salvation. And we 
We have to ask ourselves, are we letting go of stuff? Are we allowing it to continue to make things dark, acidic? Are we carrying the stuff at all? And at this point, Jesus moves on to speak to the fishermen in the crowd amongst his disciples, the, the, the businessmen amongst them, and he starts to use uh, some terms of business. But he says this, he says, what profit is it for someone to gain the whole world and then lose, that you lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the passage that Joe put on uh, earlier. It's a profit and loss illustration for the business people in the, in the congregation this morning. Jesus is using that here. There's a sense of transaction going on. And, uh, and it's a commercial picture that would have appealed to shrewd business fishermen types in the instincts of Galilean traders. And the kingdom of God uh, is, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is a good buy. Not a good buy. A good buy at any price. If it is a good buy, it is profitable at any price. The kingdom is a good buy at any price, you can imagine. And then he says this, what can you give that equals the value of your very soul, your very breath, your very life? And Jesus says, you can't give anything that equals the good buy you get with the kingdom of eternal life that comes with that. What profit is it for someone to gain the whole world? Yet lose their soul. The kingdom's a good buy, but the whole world isn't. There's no profit in it. It is a loss because you can't hold on to it. It's like sand leaks to our sinkers. The harder we try to hold on to it, the more it leaks through. Jesus says, Nothing can be given in exchange for your soul that's of that value, other than one thing Jesus himself. The one who died and was crucified on Good Friday and pays the price for it. The, the, the price of ignoring all this is to lose everything. Jesus is making a very clear point, a very uncomfortable point. He says this if you lose that, you lose everything. There's nothing left. Instead of being connected to Jesus, we begin to reconnect with the world, with this wicked, adulterous generation. Uh, and, and Jesus is saying something pretty pointed now when he says we're wicked and adulterous generation. If you don't know what that means, it basically he's pointing to the people around him, all the Jewish people, and telling them that they are in very plain English, I'm not going to say it, but plain English, illegitimate children. He's calling them that word. Illegitimate in a society that highly prized the legitimate connections that they thought they had. And if he says you're disconnected, you're disconnected, you have no father. You're in an adulterous generation. The connection that will matter in the future, Jesus says, you've lost it. What profit? Is it for someone to gain the whole world? <coughs> they lose their soul, and what can we give in exchange for their soul? I can go on further than I'm going to. I'm going to close by reading a passage from Paul. Right, I'm going to come up on the screen. I just want you to close your eyes and imagine what Paul is trying to say. When he's talking about, and remember what Jesus said about taking up the cross, denying yourself, taking up the cross, following me. This is Paul's concept of what that means for him. What does it mean for you? This is what Paul says. If someone thinks that they have reason to have a confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as to the zeal, persecuting the church, as to the righteousness based on the law, 
fault that. That whatever gains to me, I now consider them total loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything total loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is not a basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, and participation in his sufferings, becoming somehow like him in his death. And so somehow to attain for the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained with this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, we are sorry for the times when we have no idea what it looks like to deny ourselves and follow you. We have no idea what it means sometimes to take up a cross and to walk with you. Because sadly we are very focused on the comfortable and doing the things we want to do. We are sorry, Lord, for the times when we have broken your heart. Because we have denied you in some way. But we have a wonderful, good news story in Jesus' willingness to make it into you. We lift our hands to you, Lord. We ask that you to wash us clean, make, make us right, make, make us new, lift, lift us out of the dust and dirt, set our feet on a rock, give us a firm place to stand, and help us to stand firm with you, Lord, today and tomorrow and through next week. We thank you, Lord, that you are gracious, loving, and kind, that you don't abandon us the first moment of our feet slip. Come back again and again to us. Help us to hold on to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're something of what God has said in many things that I've said, uh, then if you want to pray, I can come to the front to pray. Um, I'm not praying today, because I'm not able to pray with people. Um, and uh, if you're able to, uh, if you're able to, we'll want to pray with someone next to you and pray with them. Uh, or if you're able to uh, pray with people, if there's a lot of people deciding they want prayer, and then come and help them. Uh, all you need to do if you want to do ministry in the church is to breathe oxygen and love Jesus. So let's uh, continue with that.